Welcome to Peace Now. My name is Trudy Quaife. I'm a member of Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace. We're a local organization. We've been advocating for peace and justice for over a decade. I'm your host today, and I'm joined by Layla Zand. Good to meet you. Thank you for being here, Layla. Thank you for having me. Layla is a local activist, and she's also very much involved in a national organization, the Fellowship of Reconciliation. So first I'd like to start out, if you could tell us a little bit about your background, Layla. How did you start out becoming an activist? So I guess um, the answer comes from where I'm coming from. I'm from Middle East. I am from Iran, specifically. And I think when you um, grow up in a place like Middle East, that every moment something new happens. Uh, we are, um, I experienced war, and I experienced sanctions, and I experienced oppression and um, revolution. So I, I think all of these together uh, make me an activist and make people like me an activist. But uh, specifically, I started to work with Fellowship of Reconciliation since uh, September of 2006. And I got involved with this. Um, this is an oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in North America. I got involved with them uh, since then and by their Iran program which uh, later I expanded to the Middle East program. And uh, with the passion and with the specific um, uh, focus on demilitarization of land and life uh, in Middle East. And when I talk about the Middle East, I'm not talking about the greater Middle East um, in somehow, so I'm not covering uh, North, um, North Africa, uh, but mainly Afghanistan, Iran, Israel, Palestine, Iraq, and Syria. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you're also, you also work with a local organization, oh, yeah. uh, which is yeah. Women Against War? Yes. I think this is an American saying that they said, think locally and act globally, globally. or vice oh, versa. Think, yeah, think globally <laughs> think and act globally. Lo locally. <laughs> so it's right. really important. It has been really important um, to me to be connected to uh, different local groups, including Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, Schenectady Neighbors for Peace, but specifically I have been working with this uh, wonderful group of women, um, all volunteered. They are working on different issues. I am mostly involved with their Iran uh, working group. They have different working group. Um, and um, I'm mostly involved with their Iran working group as well as um, recently I try to participate in their Afghanistan working group, also drones. Um, this local group um, has new focus on drones, which is my passion as well. And um, I'm part of the kind of national um, network against uh, surveillance and uh, weaponized drones, which um, I try to also act locally here with this wonderful group of women, Women Against War, is the affiliation of Code Pink. Mm -hmm. um, so we do different projects. Um, they do mostly, they, they are amazing group of women. They, they do a lot of, they, every day they work and um, either um, meeting with senators and representative or planning some actions or um, some just distributing flyers and uh, making awareness about different issues um, that concern them and of course our local community. Yes, I always enjoy working with them. <laughs> yeah, they are, re they are really fun and they are really passionate about the work that they do, enthusiastic mm -hmm. and um, thanks God, like we Persians say, I think, I don't know if American also said, knock the wood, they never get tired of their actions and uh, they are an amazing group of people. Yes, especially the grannies. Oh yeah. <laughs> the grannies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's back up a little bit. Um, where were you born? I was born in Tehran, capital mm -hmm. of Iran, mm -hmm. in a middle class family. And um, when I was born, actually, it was during the Shah. Um, before the Islamic Revolution. But I went to school, I was in first grade when the Islamic Revolution succeeded. And um, the um, Ayatollah Khomeini came to power in 1979. So um, I'm not guilty of hostage crisis. <laughs> and, uh, um, but I, I do understand those students who um, acted, it, it was a wrong action, but when I want to look at the history and see it was a wrong, um, wrong action, especially an in international norm that getting a hostage. 
um, but at the same time, uh, we should review Iran-U.S. relationship previous to that. And uh, sometimes um, people's psychology works in the, in the moment, and even wrong yeah. or right, they do uh, something that can have an impact for a long time. Yeah, but... Yeah. Um, well, uh, how long have you been in the U.S.? I uh, immigrated to the United States with um, my family, my husband and twin daughters. They were 18 months old when we immigrated here in 1999, mm -hmm. uh, in the beginning of 2000. And we had to leave Iran then and came here with the twins. So, mm -hmm. And since 2002, I've been local. I've uh, lived in, um, in the capital district area. Okay. Um, what do you think the conditions are like in uh, Iran right now? Um, what it, what's it like for the average person in Iran? How have the, the sanctions affected them? Um, as I said, being uh, from Iran, or in general, being from Middle East, when every moment something new happens, uh, people like me are not really disconnected. Uh, from from there. Although I have been in the United States since 2014 years, and I traveled um, to Iran last time in 2010, four years ago, but I still have um, very close connection and contact. Every day I have to follow the news and talk to my friends and find out what is really going on in the streets there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just follow the you know the official news. Unfortunately, to answer your question, I should say, unfortunately, very bad. Sanctions are um, really, as um, our previous senator, uh, Hillary Clinton mentioned, uh, this sanction is really crippling sanction for the Iranian people. Mm -hmm. um, people are having very difficult time, are feeding their children, are buying clothes, by bringing bread to their table. And um, they are dealing with a lot of problems, and especially people who have, who already were from the unprivileged community, people who didn't have a good economy background and financial support, and sick people, especially some sicknesses like cancers, or um, people who were affected by chemical weapons during Iran-Iraq war. Unfortunately, um, un the United States and some West other Western countries, they sold chemical weapon to Saddam Hussein to use it against Iran, Iranian civilians. And those people who were affected by those chemical weapons are still alive. And for many years, they used to get medications from France specifically, some European countries, and even mm, but, mm, get it from the United States, but in indirect way because U.S. and Iran didn't have a relationship in the past more than 30 years. But the problem is right now because of the sanctions, those people don't get those medications and they are suffering mm -hmm. really bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I know that there's a new government in Iran and a new president was elected and took office in August of 2013 and that would be Hassan Rouhani? Yes. Now, what do you think about the new government? Um, what are the differences? In mm. Before I say my, um, uh, what I think, I just want to share with you that um, I was coming here and I was, uh, before I come here, I was reading um, online news and I noticed that um, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, um, in one of his uh, speeches t today or yesterday, mentioned that um, any Persian who is uh, smiling is a danger or something like that. Never, tr never trust an Iranian smile. So <laughs> I guess um, because in this new president, President Hassan Rouhani, is, uh, sm smiles uh, so much and uh, makes some other governments a little worried about what is going on in Iran or if this is a, re a really true um, friendship um, that Iranian is trying to have with the international community or not. But um, I guess in, in my part, um, unfortunately I should say, uh, sometimes I think um, one system cannot be changed um, totally and truly with just changing one president. Mm -hmm. um, 
the system is sti still is the same. We still have many um, layers within the Iranian system that is not clear for us. It's not clear who is really running all of these um, different projects within the country or through the international community. But at the same time, it's a huge difference between President Rouhani and previously President Ahmadinejad. I think President Rouhani has um, years of experience, which helps him. He previously uh, have worked with international community. He previously have worked through the um, different levels of Iranian um, government and being in official levels, uh, unlike Ahmadinejad, who never had this experience. So these are really helpful, I mm -hmm. think, and especially in, in within the international community. President Rouhani understands the international community um, psychic. He understands in the international community's language. I'm not talking about the just basic language or like English or French. I'm talking about how politicians talk to one another. Mm -hmm. Like Ahmadinejad made a lot of mistakes mm -hmm. because he didn't know how to talk to the international community. And that was, that really Iranian community, Iranian population, Iranian people paid a very high price for lack of experience that Ahmadinejad had. So I'm positive on that regard, uh, and I'm really happy to hear and to see um, the um, talk between Iran and 5 plus 1 went well, and hopefully in the next six months it's going to continue well as well. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the new agreement that President Obama has been working on to uh, roll back the Iranian uh, nuclear program and to hopefully let up on some of the sanctions, um, what do you think about that? Oh, that's great. You know, uh, my organization, like Fellowship of Reconciliation, m m myself personally, I'm aware that many other organizations, like many locals that I mentioned, many nationalists and in internationals, anyone who wanted to see peace within the Middle East, anyone who are who is fed up with the war, was really days and nights worked for creating a kind of atmosphere that Iran and United States could uh, create a kind of atmosphere that they could easily have a dialogue and conversation. And they try to make it happen that diplomacy works instead of threats, instead of sanctions. And mm -hmm. this is a wonderful, wonderful time that from here, President Obama and his office, from there, the new President Rouhani, they are, and also other members of Five Plus One and um, United Nations, they are all working toward this, hopefully, um, of releasing the one set of sanctions, which is really helpful to Iranians, Iranian people in general, and also Iranian officials, including the new president, as well as, um, just creating a kind of atmosphere of dialogue and diplomacy mm -hmm. and um, hopefully um, this kind of diplomacy, this kind of dialogue, negotiations and collaborations will be, will continue specifically in regard of Syria, in regard of um, Hamas and Palestine, in regard of Iraq and Afghanistan, we see that if you, you can imagine the Iranian map right now, you see the United States has its, lots of its troops uh, are all around Iran. Mm -hmm. And um, for safety as of those troops, it's really important to have Iran in United States side. Uh, so yes. because of that, I see these negotiations are really positive. And uh, hopefully in the six months that these nego negotiations are going to continue, everything will be much better and toward a better diplomacy and to be better solutions for, for all of us. Mm -hmm. Now, I know recently several senators, in, including two sen our two senators in New York, both Schumer and Gillibrand, have both supported legislation that would actually increase sanctions and really, I think, probably do something to to actually destroy the agreement f that mm -hmm. Obama's been working on using diplomacy. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Um, like you, um, being a New Yorker and being an activist, I'm really disappointed. Mm -hmm. And um, I was very happy with uh, Senator Gillibrand, especially on the issues of women. Mm -hmm. She did a great job on that mm -hmm. matter. 
and uh, Senator Schumer also in different issues. He has done a great job, but I was really disappointed to see their names both in the supporting of the sanction uh, 1881 mm -hmm. is um, famous to this name is a number of the of the bill so um, I'm really saddened to see their names there because mm -hmm. they are undermining President Obama's efforts into creating a dialogue with the very important country within the Middle East mm -hmm. we have as I mentioned we have our troops there in Middle East we have um, our ally Israel in Middle East so even for supporting Israel I think we need to have a good relationship with Iran. And when I see Senator Gillibrand and Senator Schumer are signing this sanction bill, that means they are undermining the diplomacy that President Obama is working really hard and positively. And also they are putting a lot of life in danger because in one hand, President Obama and um, the administration are, are having this wonderful civilized negotiation with enemy. And right. on the other hand, our senators are uh, undermining that and going towards sanction, which will destroy those kind of negotiations that we were so happy and we, we talked about this. Right. And um, it's really sad to see um, that. It, I don't know. I, I really don't understand why they support this sanction bill. Even some people said, mm, because in the bill said, United States should support Israel with all means. And when you review that, you see even this bill is not good for Israeli people. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's good for some Israeli rich, I don't know, the, the different corporations who are not even care about Israeli people. Yeah, it would seem the only people that would profit would be the war industry. That, that, that would be exactly. the, only, the only motivation. It just... I, I don't it. think the American people understand what war with Iran would be like. No. Do yeah. you do you have any ideas on that? What what would a war with the Iran be like? Would it be this similar to Iraq and oh. Afghanistan, or would it be worse? Um, I would say I don't want to even think about that. Mm -hmm. You know, when I think mm -hmm. about it, I I really get. Um, it's really scary. Just it think about scary. it. Um, Afghanistan didn't have a government. And it was all tribes, and a lot of tribes that help the United States Army to get rid of Taliban. We've been there since 2001. Right. Iraq, it was the population of Iraq is just 20, you know, something more than 20 million. Iran has 75 million, and mostly young, under 30 years of age. And um, we are stuck in Iraq right now. Mm -hmm. And with a lot of um, diversities in a culture, in a religion, in different people who um, start using hatred toward one another, we are stuck in Iraq and in Afghanistan. But just think about it. Iran, from the um, perspective of size, is something like five times bigger than Iraq. Population is much more than Iraq and um, Iraqi population. And technology of Iranian um, of, of Iran is much um, advanced than Iraqis, and um, I don't know um, because lack of any other better word, I would say Iranians are very nationalist, mm -hmm. and so even those who are against the regime and they don't have any connection with the regime, they are not going to um, um, to open the doors for American soldiers and with flowers and right. say, welcome here. So um, it's, it's very much different. Um, just one thing we can keep it in mind, Iran and Iraq were in eight years of war. We had eight years of war, more than a million of people have died. And um, in that eight years, the Saddam Hussein and Iraqi administration got 100% support from all Arab allies and some European countries, plus the United States, and they couldn't win the war. That's a good point. Uh, hopefully that never will happen. That war never will happen. Hopefully. Uh, hoping that this diplomacy will work. Hopefully. Seems like the only sane alternative, doesn't it? It is. I think it is. For, for if we think we are mature people, mm -hmm. we are civilized, 
I don't understand why we immediately get our gun and we immediately immediately want to threat and want to bomb, want to you know send missiles and send our kids over there to be killed and to kill others. If we are civilized and mature people, we can just talk and solve our problems. Seems reasonable to me. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about um, Syria. Do you think the Iranian government can help resolve the problems in Syria? I think yes. You know, Iranian government are supporting Assad very openly. So if we want to talk about Syria, if we want to talk, if we want to create a kind of condition that Assad and coalition of uh, activists and um, opposition coalition in Syria come to a conclusion, those opposition group will, come, will bring the United States, for example, and um, other allies, or Saudi Arabia and other allies. So Assad needs to bring his own supports, Iran, Iran is sending missiles and, and uh, weapons to Assad. If we want to negotiate with Assad, we need to bring Iran to the table. Mm -hmm. And that was really a great job of the Ban Ki-moon who invited Iran, but he was really disappointed to see that the United States actually made that invitation to be withdrawn from Iranian, um, because that could open another level of communication and diplomacy with Iran. It, let's, let's not forget, forget this, that I don't like Iranian regime because because of them I'm here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I could be in Iran and I, I could speak Farsi and nobody would, everybody would understand me because I won't have accent and it, it would be very comfortable life there for me. It's my native. And then why I'm here because I cannot live there because of that regime. So I wanna make it clear, I'm not supporting them, but we should keep it in mind Iran is a very powerful country in Middle East. Mm -hmm. For any kind of negotiation, for any kind of diplomacy, for any kind of changing policy within the Middle East or um, with the Middle Eastern countries, we need Iran to be present there. Mm -hmm. Iran is, uh, has a 5,000 years of history. It's very powerful, has a big population, is a big country. It has its own culture, its own language. It's strong and stands over there in the past 5,000 years. And we cannot just ignore it. If we want to going forward and make the diplomacy works, we need to talk to those people. Mm -hmm. What do you think the future looks like for the Iranian people? Um, what do I think or what do I want? <laughs> Well, um, w what do you want? I want them, not just Iranian people. I, everyone, everyone, you know, right now I'm not just Iranian, I'm Iranian-American. Mm -hmm. I want the same thing for my American people that I want for my Iranian people. And for Arabs, and for, for everyone. I want, um, I want a peaceful, and a democratic condition for everyone. I want, I want us, all of us, um, build bridges of understanding um, between ourselves. And I want, um, I want us to live in a peaceful world and create a peaceful world for our children. I'm really uh, fearful of the future of this world. And um, I don't want to just be negative, but in any angle I look, you know, in an environment, mm -hmm. I'm worried for my kids. Yes. How can they live in this kind of environment with this pollution, with this land that we are destroying? And um, it's the same for, for Iranian, I want. Um, they ha especially, you know, I know that, that history and that culture, and I know those people have worked for almost 100 years constantly to bring democracy, but unfortunately they have not been successful. And I want them, I want their dream comes true. I want them to have a democratic country. I want the equality for everyone. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have the, um, like, like in United States, I'm, I understand the race has its own issues. 
in Iran, race is not the same as the United States, so it's not based on color, but we have, you know, Arab minorities, if, if minority is a good word, but uh, toward my, I want equality for all of those people. Mm -hmm. Equality on everything, you know, on uh, economy. Iran is a very rich country, but unfortunately many live under, you know, under very difficult condition. Um, so I, I guess I want the same thing for everyone. <laughs> I wish I wish all my dreams come true. All my wish comes true now. <laughs> so good, very good. I, I like that. It sounds good to me. Um, do you think the Iranian people are? Um, do they have access to information, or are they? Is their media pretty controlled? Do they know what's going on in the United States? Do they understand um, what the issues are? Um, I guess. Um, I try to answer to your question and to break them. Um, no, the media is controlled by the government. Mm -hmm. There is no private media. Mm -hmm. But yes, they have access to information because today, like us, I never watch TV anymore. That is, that is bad that I said here. <laughs> yeah. But I, I follow, I get all my news through internet. Yes. So in Iran also, they have satellite, they have internet. They um, get all the information they need through satellite and internet. And um, th the government, the bad part of that is the government control the internet. So they filter every, most of the um, different websites. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, Iranians created their own way of breaking these filters and getting access to any website they want. So if you and I go to Iran and want to access, want to go to Google.com, we cannot because we don't know how to break those filters. Oh. Hmm. But Iranians do it easily and it's like, I don't know why government filter it because they must know that people um, easily access to every, every major website they want. But in a matter, another part of your question was if they know what are the issues here. In, in the United States or what do they think about here? I think I would say no m mainly because or not in general people don't know because first of all there's a barrier in language of mm -hmm. course there are many many uh, I don't know how many percent but I am sure a higher percentage of Iranian youth they have ability to understand English so there is not that huge barrier but it's still um, whatever they get from the United States mostly is through CNN, for example, mm -hmm. is through um, uh, Hollywood, right. is, uh, is very um, mainstream. Um, but there are groups who are connected, especially through social media, connected mm -hmm. to activists in the United States. Oh, that's good. And it is, it is really good. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they get really surprised on uh, many issues that is raised by, the, by Americans. And it's really unfortunate to also, we should notice that there ha has not, have not been any direct relationship between Iran and the United States. So Iranian and American don't know each other that they much. They don't. They don't. Well, we're down to the last five minutes here. Um, I think maybe we should talk a little bit about the Fellowship of Reconciliation. Uh, that's an organization that you devote a lot of your time to. Um, would you tell us a little bit about that organization and, and what your work is? Yeah, I'm happy. Um, I love this organization. <laughs> it's, um, I, yes, I'm devoted uh, to this organization because I really believe um, the message, the mission, the vision of the organization, the history and um, their point of view. Fellowship of Reconciliation is oldest interfaith peace and justice organization in North America. So when I talk about interfaith, a lot of people ask me, is that mean we should be religious to join Fellowship of Reconciliation? Um, and the answer is no, you don't have to be religious. We are interfaith and that means um, we create a kind of open space and safe space for anyone with any background, faith background, religion ba religious background, or no non-religions at all. They can come and share their point of view uh, as long as they respect others' point of views and respect other faith groups. Um, 
Fellowship of Reconciliation uh, started in 1914. It's li started its life actually in Europe, so it's an international organization. We have branches in 40 different countries, and one branch is in the United States. The headquarter is in Nyack, New York, and um, this headquarter, this branch, uh, started its work since 1915. So we are preparing the celebration of the 100th anniversary. We are so pleased and we are so honored to have Mahatma Gandhi and Martha Luther King as members of the organizations. So I am sure uh, we all know um, 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 engineers of the nonviolent movements, uh, which there is a belief um, many, uh, many learned their lessons of Gandhi and nonviolence through the Fellowship of Reconciliation. And they, um, they shared it with Martin Luther King for the first time. So um, we are uh, supporting that idea of nonviolence. We are practicing it. And uh, we work through that. Um, the organization has um, different branches. The FOR USA or, um, One minute. has different branches in more than 40 states. And uh, we try to um, give all we can to our members, including nonviolence trainings or workshops or in different issues that they are interested. And if people are interested to know more about uh, Fellowship of Reconciliation, I suggest them to visit um, our website, uh, www.forusa.org. That's easy enough to remember, for USA.org. Very Thank good. You. Well, it's been such a pleasure to have you here today, Leila. Thank, Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you had time to do this, and I hope you'll come back and talk more as the situation with that Iran progresses, and I'm hoping for a very positive outcome here. Inshallah. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we'll be having future shows on all sorts of topics, uh, all everything from um, how the endless wars have affected our local and national economy to the future of drones and one woman's personal journey for justice. So thank you for joining us and join us again. Mm -hmm.